it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. I'm a Freemason and I have some stories to tell you. Part 1 Why would a man break the oath he took when he became a Freemason, you might ask? Well, things have gotten pretty scary before the lockdown and I need to have my testimony somewhere for the world to know what's really happening. Well, I'm sure that you've heard a lot of conspiracies about the Freemasons, how they rule the world. This one's true, actually. Or how they have clear proof of the existence of extraterrestrial life. Or how they sacrifice goats in the darkened light of their temples for the one they worship blindly. Oh, and the one I like the most is when they run naked in the forest as part of some deluded rituals. Most of these are, of course, false claims thrown by the media in our faces, just so that we can stay occupied with imbecile discussions. However, what I have to tell you is much worse. I've seen and heard things unimaginable, and in some cases unbearable for the human mind. Now, I'll not get into Masonic history, how and why it appeared, and what was its initial purpose, and all those other things, because, well, you can find that online although some of it has been a little altered, just to make them look good. Oh, I'll start my story with the initiation ritual, what happened before and after that, how I was accepted, and the sheer terror that I went through in my first visit to the temple. I'll not tell you where I'm from, because I can easily be found if I tell which Masonic Lodge I'm part of, and from what country. Although I can say I'm located in the southeast and central part of Europe, for the time being, I'll tell you about the start of my journey, and if there are people who are interested in hearing more, I'll tell you more. For example, the story of when I ran across a rather odd version of the Bible and the crucifixion of Jesus, or the real story of the 27 Club, the actual ritual you have to perform when you want to have money, fame, and talented music, but you have to give a certain something in return to a certain someone. Or I can tell you about the moment when I was really scared when a special guest was invited into our lodge to give a Masonic lecture about... Well, I'll tell you that some other time. The main reason I got into Freemasonry was because one of my teachers at the Academy of Sciences I currently do research in is a Freemason, and he took a liking to me and asked, after two years of gaining each other's trust, if I'd like to be part of an organisation who has the sole purpose of bettering the world and the individual. Well, you must excuse me if some of this text sounds wrong, because English is not my main language, but I'll try my best to feed your curiosities with the proper use of this beautiful language. I then asked him if this is an NGO or research group, so that I know whom I'm speaking to and what my conduct and behaviour should be when I went there. He said it directly. No, son. This is a Masonic Lodge I'm talking about. You'll learn new things. Things that not everyone can learn or know, because they must remain hidden to prying eyes. Now, we're looking to bring in a few bright young people, such as yourself. Because we're beginning to grow old and weary. Can't do our duties properly. I mean, son, look at me. I'm 92 years old. I could die tomorrow. And I need someone to take my place... And who can that someone be other than my best student in this whole academy? Professor, thank you for your kind words. I have to say that you have my full attention and my curiosity. But, at the same time, I've heard throughout my life all these crazy stories about the Freemasons. So I um, don't know what to say. Uh, I'm sure you heard about the fact that we are Satanists. Or we can talk to the devil, am I right? Or maybe... We can talk to the dead as well. Imagine if I could talk to Einstein right now, or to Marie Curie, Nikola Tesla, or Tartini, Beethoven, all the greats of classical music. Oh, that would be wonderful, but it's impossible. <laughs> do I look like a Satanist to you? Do I look like a bad person, or do I sound crazy when I speak? Do I pretend that I know the secrets of alchemy? <laughs> no, son, I'm just a normal person. A man of science who happens to believe in God as well. I'm very well known in my field and very respected. That's because of the 70 plus years of hard work and dedication that I put in. What do you say, son? 
Do you want to find some extraordinary knowledge? I pondered for a bit, and then I exclaimed, All right, Professor, I accept your invitation for mainly two reasons. First one being that I have a lot of admiration and respect for you, and I'm really humbled by the fact you see me as your successor. The other one is that I'm always trying to improve myself and learn new things. Son, you just made a life-changing decision. Someone will call you next week to ask for your personal details. And they'll tell you everything about the meeting. Very good, Professor. See you next week. Well, I went home without very much thinking about this. I just went off to do my normal stuff. Reading and writing articles. Publishing a few of them. Finishing some work. You know, the usual thing. The following week came and I was called by a gentleman. And we met for a discussion and he told me to be in a certain place at exactly 3.33pm the next day. No sooner or later than that. Oh, this was back in 2015. I went there. I was greeted by my teacher. He took me upstairs to a tiled room where he placed a black cloth over my eyes and then he took me to a dimly lit small room, also known as the Chamber of Reflection, where I stayed for an hour. However, this was not a normal Chamber of Reflection, nor did I reflect too much. It was only later that I found out that this lodge was one of the special lodges only known by the elite of Freemasonry in the Grand Lodge of the country. In my country, there are such lodges with only nine members each. Well, as I was sitting on the chair in the Chamber of Reflection, a small figure appeared from the dark corner of the room. The upper body was that of a really ugly man, with a very large beard, black eyes, pointy nose and ears, and very yellow teeth. What startled me was that he was standing on two legs that looked like they were his, but at the same time not, because they were... Well, goat legs. My instant judgment said it was just a costume for the theatrics of the initiation, so I went along with it. He asked me the following three questions, written on a very old piece of paper, for which I had to answer yes in order to go on with the ritual. Number one. Do you believe in the one and only true great architect of the universe? Number two, do you wish to receive his knowledge through our ancient ways? Number three, do you swear to serve the Freemasons for your whole life from here on out? And then he produced a small needle, punctured one of my fingers with it, and asked me to sign that piece of paper with my finger on what was a representation of the Eye of Providence drawn under those questions. I signed it. The little man exited the room, and five minutes later my teacher came and took me to my next part of the initiation. I entered the temple, again blindfolded. I did some not-so-cool things, like breaking stone with a hammer, drinking some sweet and sour liquids. I was half-naked, my upper left part of the body, with the chest and shoulder showing. Next, I felt something really cold. It was the tip of something metallic. Well, I figured again it was part of the ritual. A sword, maybe, I thought. All right, I said, I love these theatrics. But then, something really scary happened. The master of the lodge recited the following. Oh, he with many names, except your newest humble servant into our brotherhood. Our master, who art in fiery light and who is free in spirit. Accept this new apprentice within our rank. Apprentice, say this three times with us all. Hail Jabalon. Hail Jabalon. Hail Jabalon. You are reborn now, Apprentice. Forever through the square and compasses, and now three eternal lights. Well, at this point my heart was pounding, and then they took the blindfold off, and what I saw was that everyone's swords were raised making a circle around me with just a small opening. And then it happened. Out of a corner, someone came towards me, running through that opening, enraged and ready to attack me. It was clearly a gimmick, as the person was dressed like a goat with long horns. It stopped right in front of me, saw me shaking in fear, and a deep voice came from behind the mask, saying, 
So they had coagula and luck said to Nebre. Everyone chanted again, and I chanted with them. The figure went back to a corner. Everyone started clapping, and then they started to shake my hand one by one, greeting me. Oh, welcome, brother. Oh, brother, you were really scared. Don't worry, this is all part of the initiation. Welcome, brother. My teacher told me afterwards that all these experiences I had were to represent both good and evil parts of life, and I was now reborn anew, a better person, a Freemason, and my journey was only just starting. Oh, you will see the wonders of the world, son. Part 2. The Pripyat Grand Lodge Visit I've decided to tell you the story about my Chernobyl visit, which took place exactly four years ago, on the day the disaster turned exactly thirty years old. Now, before I start, I must tell you that this was an accident. It was not provoked by anyone. This is a hundred percent. Look, I've seen authentic documents provided by high-grade military intelligence officers in the Ukraine. They did try to cover it up, like the Soviets did back in the day. Nothing is the state's fault and all that stuff. But when Gorbachev realized that he couldn't contain the disaster, he and the party decided to let the news out. Ah, you all know the story. Some of you probably read the Nobel Prize award-winning book Voices from Chernobyl by the Belarusian author Svetlana Alexievich, or even saw the great series that aired on TV. Although some gruesome details were not included in that show, so, I'll not go into the actual disaster story. However, I would like for everyone to hold a moment of silence for all the brave men and women who lost their lives in that disaster. All the medical staff, the firefighters, and the scientists who were capable enough to contain the disaster on the 4th of May, 1986. Today marks 34 years since that disaster. Let us never forget. So, let me get started with today's story. I'll get back to my initiation ritual and what happened after I was made an apprentice at a later stage in these stories. I'll not tell them in chronological order because I want you to be surprised every single time I tell you about my experiences as a Freemason. Back in 2016, the lodge that I'm still a part of received an invitation to join the meeting of our brothers in Ukraine, most specifically the Pripyat Grand Lodge which was to be held on the 26th of April, 2016. Of course, the master and the rest of us were a bit confused because we'd never been to that part of Ukraine before, and we were a bit scared because we might get irradiated, might get sick, might get eaten by mutants, things like that. Well, after our usual meeting at the temple, the master called his counterpart in Ukraine to see exactly what this was all about. Well, suffice to say, that we all agreed to go because not only did we feel obliged, but, but it was a sign of disrespect to refuse the invitation. About a week later, we had three cars come pick us up at the temple, and with the trip being just a bit over 17 hours, we stopped and slept the night at one of our brother's hotels in Moldova, and the next day we were near the city of Pripyat, where we were greeted by our brothers with handshakes and triple fraternal accolades. We got acquainted, and they actually had prepared a tour for us to visit the surroundings of Chernobyl, where we saw Reactor 4 and the Duga 1, and then we went to have a typical Soviet lunch, like they used to when the USSR was still a thing. Then we went to visit the ghost town, and we stopped nearby the Red Forest. We were all equipped with dosimeters and hazmat suits, of course. While we were nearing the Red Forest, our Ukrainian brothers told us that we'd go somewhere to have our meeting, and then we'd go and sleep in a secret hotel that only the Masons know about. After this, military personnel pulled in front of us and escorted us to an underground bunker near the Red Forest. We descended to the third floor below ground of the facility, where we had the meeting. Our master had a speech prepared, and vice versa. After the meeting had ended, we went on having our normal brotherly banquet. However, this is where things started getting strange. The food was nothing like I'd ever seen before. The wine had multiple colours at the same time. There were some sautéed mushrooms that were phosphorescent green, and the meats were very tasty, even though they were looking like they were really overcooked. But on the inside they were very tender. 
The potatoes were turquoise, and the fish were a very pale pink with crimson tails. And, well, I was sitting, thinking, is this food real, or are they joking? Are we supposed to eat the damned rainbow in here? But the most interesting thing was the tea that they served at the end. The hot tea smelled like hot summer mornings, then changing to the smell of petrichor, then to the freezing smell of snow. It was like all seasons were trapped in that one cup of tea. We were, of course, a little bit scared to eat the food, but our brothers told us there's nothing to be worried about, as these were some ultra-rare foods that only 333 people in the world know about. After we finished, the master of the Pripyat Lodge raised his glass. Drink this final glass of wine, my brothers, and let me lead you to see the greatest secret of Chernobyl. You will meet Vovkulaka. Then we went to the fifth floor underground, where there was just a cage. Inside it, there was a man. Help me, please. You got me trapped in here. Of course, I was absolutely outraged, and I whispered to my professor. What is this nonsense, professor? Why do they torment a man like that? And even though I whispered, the master heard me and said, You know I speak your language, right? I know what this looks like, but I can assure you that shortly something that will change the way you see this man will happen. And then he started chanting some Latin phrases, threw some liquid on the man, and then claws started growing out of the tips of his fingers, hair growing everywhere. His clothes were slowly tearing apart. The man seemed to be turning into something else, something not of this world, something unholy, evil, and unnatural. Soon, razor-like teeth started growing from his mouth, his eyes turning a dark shade of crimson red. His metamorphosis was complete, and the man was no longer a man, but a huge, monstrous type of wolf. Mortals, one day I will escape this prison, and I will kill you all. Mark my words. You have had me confined for the last four hundred years. Since that day that I tore apart your lands, I will escape some day. I will end this world in blood and fire. I was absolutely petrified. I stood still for the next ten minutes or so. My teacher, though, was as calm as they come, meaning that this was something usual for him. I was left wondering how many horrors there are in this world, what things exist here, what darkness lives on this world with us. The master took out another liquid, threw it on the creature, and it started shrieking, letting out sounds not of this world. After that, it turned back to that man again, and we left. Well, still in shock, I asked, almost crying, What was that? Why don't you just kill it? The master looked at me disapprovingly, and said this was an 850-year-old werewolf, and since his capture, the Masons had been trying relentlessly to alter his mind, using certain substances, which I know nothing about, and to make more creatures like this, eventually turning them into armies for future wars. Ah, oh, yes, I know we have all this technology now, and we can make robots and whatnot, but these guys have a lot of secrets. If they kept him for so long, it must be very valuable to them. Maybe immortal, who knows? Well, after this we sort of, um, fainted. Woke up the next morning in the hotel, which didn't look like the hotel we'd been in, but like an apartment building that felt like it was constantly moving. And no, I was not hungover. On my table in the room, I found a note saying that they wished us a great trip back home, thanking us for accepting the invitation and hoping we could meet again, sooner rather than later. Also, that there was a bottle of that tea wrapped up as a present. And to this day, I have never opened it. Well, until next time, stay safe and take care. Part 3. The Church of Ghosts This story will take us back to 2018 when we had our international meeting, which takes place every five years. 
Well, by now I was used to all the weird stuff going on inside our temple, and of course outside of it, where the secrets of the world lay dormant for the normal people, but not for us Freemasons. Our meeting two years ago took place in a very beautiful hotel in Prague, in the Czech Republic. This was one of those that's filled with history, where the walls and chandeliers have seen extravagant parties taking place, and people in really expensive clothing attending and drinking the finest and rarest of drinks. I met a lot of powerful Freemasons at that banquet, people very well known in the world, some of them running multi-billion dollar companies. I learned a lot of things that they do research on, things I could not even imagine had existed, and of course I was left in awe with the topics of certain discussions at that party. I was accompanied by my mentor, the professor, who had decided back in 2014, as you well know, to show me the wonders of the world. Oh, too bad that we have different views on what that means. Now, usually at banquets like these, nothing out of the ordinary really happens. It's mainly just a bunch of people in black suits talking about various scientific topics, improvements in certain industries, or the evolution of technology in the coming years. But at the end of that party, my mentor took me outside the hotel to have a talk. Son, let's go out for a bit. There's something I need to tell you. Of course, Professor. Son, tomorrow at midnight there's a place where we'll go from our lodge just the two of us and the master. Now there'll be some very powerful and influential people at this meeting. What is it this time, Professor? Vampires? Czech monsters? What? The dark god of Czech beer? What? <laughs> You're very funny, he said, ironically. No, oh, we'll have this meeting in a church 200 kilometers from Prague, in the village of Lukova. As I understood from one of our brothers that flew in from the United Kingdom, this church is a bit different from the rest of the churches in this country. Why, I don't know. I guess we'll see tomorrow night what's going to happen. Okay, Professor. I understand and I won't ask any more questions. Sometimes I like to inquire a lot about things because I'm a very curious person, as you know. Well, be careful, son. Curiosity killed the cat. But satisfaction brought it back, Professor. Well, the party ended, and we went to sleep. We woke up the next day and went for a walk in the beautiful city. And I can tell you, without a single shade of doubt, the Czechs have the best beer in Europe. We went to see the St. Vitus Cathedral, the Charles Bridge, the Astronomical Clock, Kinski Palace, the Prague Castle, and the Old Town Square. These were the wonders of the world for me. And we, of course... Got to see the hidden parts of each and every location, parts that the public was not allowed to see. Because, of course, that's how things are supposed to be, in the opinion of the Freemasons. Then we went back to the hotel, changed into our usual black suits, black tie attire, took our aprons and gloves, and we went outside the hotel at about 9pm to meet the driver who would take us to the church. We got there around 1130 that left us with 30 minutes of free time in which a brother from the Czech Republic told us the story of the church. Well, the St. George's Church was built in 1352, but in 1968 the roof collapsed during a funeral, so it was very much abandoned up until an artist decided to make things more interesting in 2014 by adding mouldings of people on top of which he placed some sheets to make them look like ghosts praying. Brother Heineck went on. Dear brothers, let's go inside. But before that, there is a table here at the entrance. Please, each and every one of you, take these metal blocks and keep it with you until the meeting is finished. Welcome to the Church of Ghosts. Well, the master, the professor and I looked at each other, wondering what these were for. We proceeded to take these metals, which were roughly 500 grams in weight, and they were, of course, triangle-shaped. We went inside, and we were startled by the silhouettes standing still in the darkness. Then our Czech brothers rapidly lit some candles, and we got to sit down next to the figures. I was a bit uneasy, because I don't really like being alone in a church at night, even more so when the church is old and creepy and filled with mouldings that resemble people. The master of the Prague Lodge started. Dear brothers, 
Welcome to one of the most exquisite meeting places for people like us. I hope you all had a great time at the party yesterday and got to see our beautiful city. Please, place each of your metals in the lap of the molding next to you and leave it there until we finish this meeting. Then, of course, we started having the speeches. After half an hour or so, after midnight, all the candles went out and a cold wind started to blow inside the church. The floor was creaking and a very thick fog started raising from under it. Then, I felt something moving beside me. I turned, and at my right side, the head of the ghost was turning towards me, staring at me with its non-existent eyes. I screamed, and then a voice from out of time began to speak. Brothers, dear brothers, do not be afraid. We come in peace. We are the Freemasons of the Grand Lodge from beyond time. We have been here for many, many eons, silently watching you to see if you're doing your jobs properly, and we could not be prouder than we are right now. Greetings to everyone who came from different parts of the world. We are very happy that you are here with us tonight. And then another one started. Brother. You will experience something tonight you have never experienced before. Please place your hands on our foreheads and let us take you to a journey of magic throughout time. The thing is that their voices were speaking in the Czech language, a language I know nothing about, but curiously enough, I was understanding it perfectly. I placed my hand on the ghost's forehead, and at that point I felt like I was enlightened and filled with secret knowledge. With my eyes closed, I could see different historical periods. I was in a forest where strange animals were living. Then I was transported under sea to see populations of humanoids living free. Their technological advancements, nothing like I'd ever seen before. I saw kings and queens, empires falling, kingdoms of long-forgotten dead gods, ruins of cities in the sky, strange civilizations visiting our planet. But then, everything stopped and a man with a white hood on his head, a large staff in his hand and a grey beard stood in front of me in a tent in the desert. Hello, traveller. Give me your hand. I did so without even questioning him. Then he took out a very strange object. It was like a red-hot stone, almost like coal, but not quite, and he placed it in my hand. I squeezed it, and when I opened my hand, all that was left was a red light floating around my palm. I looked at him with inquiring eyes, and then he took out from a bag in his pocket a very odd powder. Then he placed the powder inside the red floating light, and with his scepter, smashed it, yelling, Tria! Tria! And a large explosion occurred, knocking me over, but not hurting me. I awakened some minutes, well, at least for me later in the church with my hand extended. In my hand there was the metal block, but its colour changed. It was golden. Of course I couldn't believe my eyes. My mind was already buzzing with all that I'd seen in my short journey. Brothers, Vivat Alchemia, this is our gift to you. Please be careful on your future journeys and take this gold home with you as a way to always remember your experience here tonight. So long, dear brother. I checked my watch. It said 6.30 a.m. I looked at the gold triangle. On it was the representation of the exact same ball of light I'd held in the palm of my hand. The sun came up in the sky and everything was back to normal. We went back to Prague, none of us saying anything for the next few hours. We just sat frozen and bewildered with our magical gold in our hands. I was seeing not only the wonders of the world, but also the riches of the world. Part 4. The Horror at Hoya Forest I used to be one of those people who did not believe in the supernatural. Monsters, demons, vampires, and all the things that should not be. However, for the past six years I've been constantly proven wrong, and I was shown by forces beyond my reach and understanding that we are not alone, 
We were never alone and we will never be alone. I've seen things that can churn your stomach, that can make your heart stop beating or even question your existence. This time I'll tell you about one of my vacations that I'll never forget and that I wish I could take back. As you know from the stories you've heard so far, strange things seem to follow me ever since I had the fortune to become a Freemason. No matter what happened, I always managed to stay lucid and keep my composure until the very end of these strange occurrences. For us Freemasons, summers are usually off. We don't have any kind of official gatherings, however we do meet like friends in the white meetings, as we call them. We just eat food and drink wine, like normal people. I've had many of those, some of them really pleasant because you get to talk to some good people about great things. But there are also evil people there as well, so it's kind of a battle of forces between good and evil. Some of them want evil to reign supreme, and some of them want to destroy every vile thing that the Freemasons stand for. Their temple of lies will fall one day, and their false god will burn in the purging fires of all that should protect us. Well, last summer, before this whole crazy pandemic happened, I have a story about this as well. It'll come later. I don't want you to be scared more than you are right now. Well... We were invited by some Freemason friends to spend a few days on a lovely property just a bit outside of the city of Cluj, Napolka, in Romania. A very beautiful city indeed. Great food, great people. You should visit if you have the chance. Most of us have regular nine-to-five jobs, of course, so we decided we should spend a weekend there. Booked a flight, and we got there in about an hour on a Friday night. The property was filled with one-room little houses so that all brothers could relax and rest well. We went in, made ourselves comfortable, changed to casual attire, and went outside to socialise. The property was placed in the heart of nature, far away from inquiring eyes. It was surrounded by a thick forest called Huya. Its trees were very oddly bent, like they'd seen the horrors of the world. Behind the forest, a river was rapidly streaming away into the silence of the night. I'm a really big fan of barbecues, so it was my idea to not go to a restaurant in the city. Instead, we should have a nice barbecue done at the property, by ourselves, because it would give us a better vibe, given the whole rustic scenery. Everyone agreed, and we proceeded on lighting the thing up. After a few hours or so, when we were almost ending our small party, we heard screaming voices echoing from the woods, unaware of the dangers we would face later on. So me and four other brothers took our flashlights and decided to go and see what the screaming was and where it was coming from. I was scared to see what terrors the night would bring upon us because the things we'd faced in the past were absolutely horrifying. As we delved deeper into the forest, after what seemed and felt like most of an eternity, not knowing what fate we would have, we were starting to get closer to the source of the screaming. As we were approaching... We started seeing the river, and on its edge there was a woman wearing a white dress that seemed to be made out of clouds, almost vaporous. And then she turned. Her face was the whitest white I'd ever seen. Her eyes were so dark they could have looked straight into your soul, leaving you a petrified statue. The most scary part was that on her face was what appeared to be some sort of black blood dripping down from her eyes. She started coming at us hastily, so we started running, but when we turned around, another four women were there, mid-air, floating, and watching down on us, almost like the hunter, and that we were the hunted. The creatures of the night needed to feed. I know some of the Eastern European legends, and so given that we were in Romania, I remember hearing stories about the so-called Ilia which were spirits of tormented women who only wanted to prey on men, making them go absolutely insane. The legend says that you must not speak to them, nor say their name. So they started singing and dancing in circles around us. Two brothers started crying in absolute fear, and the rest of us were mesmerized. Then, like touched by grace, I snapped out of it and yelled, Do not look at them and close your eyes said and done, except for one of our brothers. His gaze could not turn away from the spirits, and then one came close to him. Would you come with us, handsome? She said, slowly caressing his face. Yes, I want to, he said, 
not even finishing his sentence. They raised him up in the air, and then they disappeared with him into the depths of the dark forest. No, I yelled. Brothers, snap out of it. We have to go after him. We started running like madmen, not knowing where we were going or what fate awaited us. We started the search, looking for houses in the forest, for lights for a single trace of our brother. And before we knew it, morning had come. The first rays of sun shining shyly, almost afraid to enter the forest. After our searches came to no avail, we found our way back to the houses and decided to rest for a couple of hours before going back to the woods. We were severely dehydrated and frightened to our very bones. As we were approaching the property, the rest of our brothers were outside waiting. Hey guys, we're back. You would not believe what happened to us. We yelled collectively, almost running out of breath. We all stepped aside, revealing our lost brother sitting in a chair, with his head lowered and, well, his physical appearance was changed. His hair had turned white. He looked like he'd lost twenty pounds, and he was almost a vegetable. He could not speak. All he could do was mumble incoherently. We told them what happened. They were in shock, but they also knew what horrors lived with us in places where we humans should not go, and they understood the grave situation we were in. We all decided, though, to stay a few more days. We called the ambulance. We invented some story about how he'd woken up like that, because obviously we couldn't say the real story. They took him to the local psychiatric hospital for tests, where he is still confined to this very day. After a few days had passed, the doctor called one of us, and the diagnosis was severe schizophrenia combined with dementia. The doctor told us that our brother was having hallucinations about five women who were trying to take him away from the hospital. And other times he would just dance by himself in a padded room. Oh, brother, I'm sorry we could not save you. Truly sorry. Part 5. The Tragedy of Estrigoi In our private library we have millions of documents and tomes from throughout different times in history, since the beginning of man. Superb poems, prose, ancient scrolls describing amazing events that happened in history, some of them not even known by man. I was mostly interested in finding writings about the Eastern European folklore, although many of the experience that I've had in the past has made me realize that many legends were in fact as real as the moon hanging lifeless in the night sky. As I was looking for something to feed my mind with, a strange brown leather sort of journal fell down from one of the shelves. I went to pick it up, and I noticed that it was a normal journal about village life in Wallachia in the 15th century. However, some pages described something horrible. November 30th, 1437 AD. The Black Hill Village, Wallachia. The Diary of Janos Chira. It's now three weeks since I've seen my brother. I do not know what happened to him, how or why he disappeared. I found a small pool of blood in his room the morning following his disappearance, and since then something has changed in the village. Something evil was beginning to make its presence known. The air was changing. It was starting to feel very heavy at night. Mysterious mist was slowly enshrouding the city under the dead eyes of the moon. People started disappearing regularly, almost every week, their screams echoing in the night. Doors were bolted shut. Garlic was hanging outside every house now, and slowly the village was turning into a graveyard. I decided to hold a meeting with the rest of my companions at the Lodge of Eternal Light so that we could see if we could discover what was going on and if it could be stopped. The evil cut clean at its root. Brothers, I have called you here tonight to put an end to this insanity. Something is taking away the village folk, and it's our duty to make sure that this has an end. Have any of you seen anything out of the ordinary lately, besides the obvious screams and bad omens floating around in the village? Uh, Brother John, you may speak. Yes, sir. Uh, last night I was doing my nocturnal round on the streets. I felt some presence walking behind me when I was turning corners, its steps doubling mine. Every time I turned, no one was there, so I started running to see if it would follow me, 
I heard the steps running after me. I turned my head for a second, and when I turned it forward again, an unnatural shape was standing in front of me, and it said to me, Mortal, I will eat your soul and drink your life right here and now. Standing in fear, I started praying to God, while the thin silhouette was laughing mockingly as tears fell down my cheeks. Do you think your petty God will help you? Do you think a faceless, cruel God cares for a pest like you humans? who know only to kill each other in meaningless violence and endless wars. Your God is dead and heaven is burning. Then how are you still alive, John? What did the creature look like? I asked. My only salvation was this little bottle of holy water which I threw in the face of the creature, and this silver cross which I got out, pointed it like a weapon towards him, and he started shrieking and hissing, covering his eyes at the sight of the cross. Oh, sir, the creature was thin, very pale, its eyes an evil shade of red, it had claws, and his mouth was bloody. His teeth were sharp, and he was bald. He was a living dead, a creature risen from the grave in the night, only to consume human flesh and blood. This was a thing of evil, sir, a strigoi. We must find where it sleeps and kill it, sir, and we must do it quickly, or there will be more deaths. I understand. Thank you, John. Every one of us in the room stood aghast at the hearing of such troublesome news. We had never experienced anything like this, and we were not prepared for a battle like this either. We would heard about the Strigoi from the elders of the village, but we did not take it as true, only as a story. We knew we needed stakes, torches, silver crosses, holy water, and cloves of garlic. And now I knew my brother had been killed by this vile, sickening monster, and I swore to avenge him even if it meant that I had to give away my own life. The plan was to trap the monster in the village square, so we drew a large circle with flammable material so that we could light it up by shooting an arrow from the roof. Two of our brothers offered themselves as bait for the Strigoi. And I came and our brothers waited in the middle of the circle, looking like they were repairing something as to not give away the plan. We had men standing on top of roofs ready to show the arrows, while I was waiting patiently in a corner, ready for attack. In the silence of a night that seemed eternal, a figure appeared behind one of our brothers in the circle, enraged with madness. Before an arrow was shot, our brother was ripped to shreds. The other one tried to fight the demon, but before raising his sword, rivers of blood started flowing from his neck, with the Strigoi feeding and yelling like a demented beast. But his hunger blinded him, and he realized very late that he was trapped. I rushed inside the fiery circle, and I threw holy water on him, with vapors rising from where the water touched him. I placed the silver cross on his head, and as he was turning and screaming, I wanted to kill him with my silver knife, but as I tried putting it through his head, the creature raised its hand and blocked it, the blade going right through, blood coming down. He saw a small opening in the circle and made a run for it, slowly vanishing into the night, leaving a bloody trail behind. I yelled at my men to follow the trail, with me leading them. Five hours later, tired and with almost no energy left in us, we arrived at the entrance of a cave. The sun had come up in the morning sky as we entered the cave, and we saw the shape of a coffin. We found its resting place. Men, take the coffin out and take the lid off, I yelled. Inside, the creature lay dormant, unaware that it was nearing its end. Its hideous apparition, the vile aura surrounding him, the miasma coming out from inside the coffin made us all wretch. As I was preparing to put my knife through its head, I noticed a piece of paper. I took it out and started reading it. If you are reading this, then I am probably nearing an end that I have been waiting for the past 120 years of relentless haunting and hunting in these lands. I was turned to a Strigoi against my will, and I wish I can take back all the destruction and suffering I have brought unto this world. My name was Simeon, but now I have no name. The living dead bear no names. As I turned the paper, on the back of it, the following was written. The silent songs of death now echo through this freezing crypt. I only wish to rest now, so 
Please end me in my sleep. I am the living dead and I cannot stop the urge to kill, because my hunger makes me do things far beyond my will. Now leave me here to rot forever, dead and torn apart. Just turn my head backwards and impale my broken heart. So, Dr. Creepin gives up his deepest, darkest secrets right here. <laughs> okay, truth be known, um, I record these outros um, often a lot later than I do the actual vocal for these stories. And sometimes, to be fair, I've had a glass of wine or two when I do this, so I'm in a bit of a different mood, to say the least. <laughs> so you have to forgive me. Um, no one seems to have noticed before, but yeah, I'm often a little bit merry. Not drunk or anything like that, but you know, it's the evening and I've relaxed a little bit. After a long, hard day of recording these beautiful stories for you all. So, yep, here I am. A little bit, you know, happy, let's say, uh, recording the outros. Well, did you like that one? What did you think? Oh, I quite like this. If you like it, then I've got about another, at least one more hour-long video of um, Freemason stories for you lined up. Maybe even tomorrow. Let me know in the comments section below the video and if you like it, I'll do them all really soon for you all. Can't say better than that, can you? Well, my dear friends, I feel like one more glass of wine before I go to bed. That's alright, isn't it? Good, thank you very much. Well, until next time, very, very sweet dreams and bye-bye. <laughs>